All right. Yay! It's working. Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's me, Natalie, from Creative Makers. And oh, just so you know, they they come. They they're not always all at once. Mm -hmm. And then lots of people watch it in reruns. So don't worry. Okay. But it's like a sitcom. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, hi everybody. I am so happy today to have my friend Chris Zambone. I had to pull her yes. to talk to her <laughs> because this is not something that she enjoys doing. Hello, first person. Thank you for being here. Um, so today I've got a, a slightly different setup too. I've um, got my iPad here so that maybe I don't have to walk up to the phone and you don't have to see my nostril hairs when I'm reading your questions. Natalie. It's, I know. <laughs> it's, it's really super, super weird. So, um, oh, it doesn't, it won't do what I want it to do. Oh, finally. Okay. It's me, Natalie, from Creative Makers. But I'm going to have to turn this yeah. off so that you can't hear me talking to myself. There we go. Okay. Anyway, so, again, hello, second person. All right, so I'm here with Chris. <sighs> thank you. And for, I love Natalie. Thank you for meeting with me because I know this is a big deal for you. I really mm -hmm. appreciate it. I know I've told thank you a million you. times, but I'm going to tell you a million times and more. <laughs> All right. So I start with only one question and then everything sort of jumps off of that. Okay. So this question's easy. You know the answer to it. Tell me about what being creative looked like for you when you were a kid. I always drew. And, you know, little stuff like crayons that every kid does. But when I realized there was art, was a magazine oh, my pops. parents had called Wisdom. And it was 1957. Are you serious? Oh, my this, God. This is the first time I realized there was art. And just in case you can't see, there's Rodan. Rodan's the thinker is on the back. Is it on and the front too? On, on the, the front. front. And as a little girl, I I could not imagine something like this. And I looked at this and here well how many years ago was this? Seventy uh, was, sixty I don't know. 50. <laughs> yeah, so a long time. It was like 70, almost 70 years ago. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and I I looked at these Rodin sculptures, and I could not believe it. It's the first time. And I... How old were you? Like, around how old were you? Well, I was born in 1949, so this I would be eight years old. Wow. Seven okay. or eight. Seven or eight when you figured this part out. This this just fascinated me so much that all these years I've kept it. My first introduction to art. Wow. So that's quite an intro. Oh man, I, I just I couldn't believe it. Of course, nobody that I knew looked <laughs> looked like this. No. And I didn't know that the human body looked like this and that somebody could actually do this. So Rodin was my first hero, and I did take some sculpture classes, but I didn't go through with it, <laughs> some figure sculpture. Uh, as, as a child? No. Oh, that's later. That's later. Okay, but as a child, how, how did you start interpreting what you were seeing here into what you parlayed next? Well, I guess... I just I just went to the library and I found art books and I looked at them and I lived in a small very small northern Wisconsin rural town with 8000 people or 7 and the only reason we had art books in the library was because there was a doctor's wife who donated them oh I want to do that I want, when I die, to leave money to a library for art books because this is what right. really is what inspired happens. me. And uh, 
I used to skip school, which was bad. I'm not going to, I'm not, no judgment. (laughs) I cannot say that I don't know about this. I skipped school a lot and I would walk downtown to the, to the library and I don't know, nobody seemed to uh, do anything about it. And then I would secretly catch the bus home and my parents never knew I was skipping school. So and wait a minute, wait a minute, days, wait a minute. So you were skipping school I to was. go to the library. Yes. That's hard. That hardly seems like a salacious act. Well, <laughs> It, was, it wasn't a very good thing. My parents didn't know about it, but they knew I loved art. And then uh, when, from the time I was born, we went, my family went to Florida every year in the winter because we had a summer resort. And so we would go on vacation and they would take us out of school and get a tutor and, uh, But where we went was Sarasota, Florida. That's the home of the Ringling Museum, the Ringling Art School. And they had, I went to the Ringling Museum. There were Rubens in there. There were, uh, they have seven huge Ruben cartoons. I had never seen anything like it. And sculpture and paintings and I was just, that's what I wanted to do. So that's so, it. it. It just sealed the deal. It did. And so every year when we would go to Florida, uh, when I was really little, my parents would uh, put me in an art class. And yeah, I like that. And uh, later on, I skipped school again. <laughs> skipped school some more? <laughs> I did. And um, I went to Florida and I took some art lessons from some teachers, but I didn't go to college and I did not go to art school. So uh, I'm self-taught in a lot of ways. So so how did you make that transition from basically high school <clears throat> or lack thereof? How did you make that transition <laughs> from high school into like actually... Were you experimenting with paint by then? Oh, sure. <clears throat> yeah, of course. I was painting and I loved landscapes because I grew up in a rural area in the North Woods. Uh, that was my environment. And it we didn't have neighbors. Right. And so that was pretty much what I glommed on to was nature. And uh, I was also had a lot of health problems. And uh, so I couldn't do things, so I drew. And the health problems that I had, and, and they looked insurmountable, uh, was really a gift. You know, you're the second person, second artist I've talked to that had a very similar thing, had health really? issues as a child. Yeah, and then spent, found, said, well, there wasn't a lot I could do, but I could draw. Yeah. And it sort of just grew from there. Yeah, and uh, it sounds like our family had some money, but we didn't. <laughs> and so I would get paper, and I was afraid that I was going to run out of paper. So i draw a little bit and a little here and a little there because I was afraid I wouldn't get any more paper. <laughs> but, of course, I did. And uh, then... Um, I thought, oh, I would love to go to the Ringling School of Art. Yeah. But uh, you had to have graduated from high school. <laughs> oh. So you couldn't get your GED, or did you? Was that just not in the cards? Well, I did actually. Oh, you did. Yeah, but uh, by that time, I had other things going on, and uh, but I always painted, always painted. So when you first started painting, were you painting more representationally? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you were really trying to like make things look like things. And, right. And I didn't even really know much about abstract work except at the Ringling Museum, which, you know, I, I hadn't gone to any museums anywhere, like in Chicago or Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. So uh, I didn't even know much about it. But uh, I like both. 
And I think both of them teach you and help you with the other. So if you do an abstract, it helps you with something more representational and vice versa. Yeah. Um, so, so then how did you actually make the move into your style? Did that just come from repetition or, I mean, cause you clearly have a particular, I mean, I, I see your work and I know it's you. I mean, I never have to question who did it. <laughs> hmm. Well, I don't know. You don't know. It just sort of came. I just paint and I love color and I love rhythm. And um, I did take art lessons. You know, when we'd go on vacation, I would take some art lessons. And um, I took some uh, lessons in watercolor, and uh, which I don't do now. But... Well, you sometimes. Know, I was going to say, you do them on occasion. Occasionally I do them. Um, but they're, they're never, I, I never have the patience for them. Um, I don't like watercolors where somebody paints it and then paints on it and then paints on it. I like it like it looks like a sergeant. <laughs> you know, it's just there like all at once like kind it, of it, all it at looks once like... the best of the sergeant watercolors where the they're done at once and that's it and that's the only way i like really like the watercolors why don't you like them when they're layered or done in because they're not fittings? spontaneous and they don't have that feeling oh in. too tight they're too tight and uh they don't they don't move I, I can't explain that. No, I can't help but notice that there's oh. a watercolor sitting right oh, here. Oh, yeah, there is. <laughs> here, I'm going to bring it up so that you guys can see it, and then we'll let Chris, like, talk about it. So it's wrapped in plastic, so if there's a sheen, I'm sorry. But I am I have a feeling that we're talking about exactly what you were you like. Yeah. That they're done all at once, that there's not multiple passes, Mm -hmm. because you want to you want to see that that movement's there without right. any question i i want it put down once and leave it and i try to do that with my oils mm -hmm. but uh i i do have another watercolor okay if i can find oh. it quickly what did you're, i do no you're oh. good um, um okay I, I was just gonna tell everybody you guys have no idea how much space she has here um, in terms of, of where her art is. It's everywhere. Okay. This is a floral, but it's all done at once. And it's, it's uh, not gone over with detail or after, I'm gonna lower this a after bit. something has dried. So it's all done at once. I find this very difficult. I bet. <laughs> I, I, I mean, don't, so I don't do it. <laughs> well, because I'm the queen of like I love layers, and and so you know I don't often see everything all at once. Well, and I'm just gonna back it up so that you can see it's this all. It's very time. hard to do, so I don't do it. <laughs> I can understand that. And, and when you're working, but a lot it's of fresh because of, it's because if you don't go back into it, it's fresh. It's right. alive. Right. And when you put a lot of layers on it, this is for me. Right. No, I know. I know this is the way you work. Now, do, is that true about your um, oils as well? I go over my oils more. You do? Yeah. And I wish I could just put it down once. Uh, do you have any that you've done that you've only like, done one one pass? So oh, to speak? yeah. I... I uh, well, this, this We've got one, a wall behind us here. this is, looks kind of abstract, but okay. I'm going to hold it and then I'll move it forward. This was done in Ferndale. And, which is in, in Griffith Park here in California. Mm -hmm. And this is a figure and this is the stream that runs through Ferndale. And that I just did, you know, just all just, at once. All at once. So here. Let's see. What others do I? Oh, this is another yeah, I'm one. I'm going to bring this a little closer so that you can see the figure that we're talking about here. Oh, I know. Kim's boat, little boat. And then I'm going to back it up just a little bit so that you can see. Okay. And then this we're is. going to take down everything on the wall. That doesn't matter. <laughs> 
This is also done at once. This is Kim's little boat. My husband's name is Kim. And, uh, oh gosh, look at the dust on it. Uh, that's done. He has a little sailboat in Wisconsin. And so I stand on the dock and I've done oh, so many of these, they're just little quick ones. And they're all done at once. And then they're fresh and they, and they move. I can see, I can see what you mean about, about wanting to do something all at once and keeping it fresh. What somebody says, I think Deborah Hughes says, lay it and leave it. <laughs> That's a really interesting, it's just really an interesting idea if you're looking for spontaneity in your work mm -hmm. and, you, and you want it to be dynamic. Yeah, and I married a jazz musician which of course is spontaneous. He's all about and, fluidity. Yeah, and thinking on the spot and and being creative on the spot and then he leaves it. And when he records something, um, he is a great believer in going through once, maybe twice, rarely, and leaving it all. and. And he has done uh, albums with big bands, and somebody won't like something, and and with no rehearsing, leave it, and that comes out fresh. Don't go, keep going over and over in your recording, and that's the way I like to paint. So that's how we we go. <laughs> you know what, in relationship to music, because I know that you're, I mean, with Kim around, there's a lot of musical influence here. Oh, yeah. Do you, has that affected your work too? Oh, sure. But I listened to jazz right. way before I met Kim. I mean, my parents listened to it and um, they supported uh, a jazz program on public radio. And that's how I met Kim. And that's another story in Wisconsin. I knew he was different because he walked into my family's little resort and he had shoes on with flat soles. And the men, <laughs> men in Wisconsin at that time especially, always had thick soled shoes because they walked in the gravel and the dirt and the woods and yeah, everywhere. Yeah. And I said, Oh my gosh, where's he from? <laughs> he looked at his shoes and, uh, and wondered where he was from. That's yeah, funny. <laughs> wasn't from from uh, from there. <laughs> but um, yeah, music. I've always loved music. When kids were listening to the Beatles, and I did listen to the Beatles, and I did like them, but they didn't say enough to me. I really wanted that depth of Coltrane. And that, you know, that just Coltrane. Uh, but I mean, but living with the musician, I, I mean, of Kim's caliber, and I know it's pretty, pretty incredible. I mean, you are not just inundated with the music of Coltrane on the radio. You like live Coltrane in this house <laughs> I, with somebody reinterpreting versions of this mm -hmm. over and over and over again yeah as well as his own stuff i mean you get exposed to all new kinds of things i know and my parents uh, uh, i have to give them credit too because in rhinelander wisconsin where i'm from there were not really any music stores and they had to call uh, a store in milwaukee called the radio doctors and they would say, send us some albums. And they said, we have this much money to spend. And they would send, they'd pick out the best jazz records they could and send them to my parents. And I think that's something that I think is pretty good, that even if you don't have the resources, you, you find a way. And, and that's something that uh, Kim has said. Uh, people who say they don't have education or uh, they haven't gone to a music school, uh, if it's there, 
you will find a way. Well, same. I mean, you're talking about music right now and what Kim says, but I mean, this is that's evident also in an art. Me. Yeah. That's also me because I didn't have anything. I mean, I think about how important music was to your parents and mm-hmm. how they went out of their way, saved money, right. and had to go out of their immediate area. Mm-hmm. And have music sent to them because right. they couldn't get to it any other That's way. Right. I mean, that is a commitment to the yeah, arts. It really is. Now, were your parents supportive of of you uh, uh, moving in the direction of art? Yes. Yes, and uh, well, they didn't pay too much attention to it. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, did they have an opinion? Did they want you to do something else? Uh, yes, they wanted me to help with the family business. Oh, they wanted you to just right. sort of move the right into that. the little resort business, and it was small, and I shouldn't, you know, go somewhere else. Right. And then one day I picked up and Went somewhere moved else. To, <laughs> to L.A. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, people often say that you, well, I don't have... I, I didn't go to school. I didn't go to music school. Somehow people find a way. Exactly. If you're and, curious, it's right there. It's yeah. there. And I think, I can't remember, but Arthur Ashe, who's a tennis, was a tennis player, said something, uh, I've got it written down somewhere, about using what you have and going from there. Use what you have. Don't, you know, worry about, the, just use what you have, and that's what you do. You use what you have. And uh, I think that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. But, you know, the, the beauty, of, I mean, especially of, of the time we're living in now, I mean, it's a curse and it's a blessing is the Internet. Yeah. I mean, there's access to everything. That's right. If you're curious, it's here. Mm-hmm. You know, you may or may not like the way it's presented. But you can find another way that it's presented mm-hmm. and, and find a way to express yourself and, and yeah, use that. I, I, I think so. And uh, I resisted it for a long time. And I don't post things. That, I'm going to change that. Is that, is change that today's it. proclamation? I'm changing <laughs> that. <laughs> you know, people love seeing other people's work. They do. I they, do. I do too. I love seeing process photos. I love seeing mm-hmm. process videos. Mm-hmm. How people like move from the beginning of their painting to the end of their painting and what it looks like mm-hmm. in between. Because I mean, let's. I don't know about you, but I know there's always that ugly phase where I'm just like, oh, here's the ugly phase. Got to move past it. You know. You don't. You don't get it. Okay. Never mind. I don't get it. Never mind. Not for Chris. What? <laughs> You don't have an ugly phase in your painting. But you know what? You work all at once, too. See, I don't work all at once. So I lay something down. I block it in. Yeah. And then there's like somewhere between blocking it in and getting near the end that I'm just, I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh, how do I even get it to where I want it to go? I get I'm like that. You are? Well, of course. Everybody in, in the I art, would think so art. too, but you looked at me so questioningly. I well, thought maybe I'm thinking I was thinking about a face. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm thinking about a face. So, a face. Because Kim will look at something else. What's that dog in there? Oh. <laughs> or what What is that? Well, that's that's an eye over there. And then I get really disgusted. Well, that's because yeah. sometimes our spouses, you know, oh. there's. Their filters aren't working quite the way we want no, them to. No, 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 no. Um, so I I can't help but notice that you brought some books. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about, I know, your favorite book, and one that I have as well that I need to investigate further, and it's called The Art Spirit by Robert Henry. And um, I just want you to notice it's falling apart. <laughs> I, th- I think it's been, and it's got lots of, like, she's got tags in it, so t- let's talk about this book and what it means to you. What what did what did that help you with? Well, I think I think the main thing that I I got from this book, if I have to pick one thing, it's about even if there is just one small corner of truth in in your painting, you 
did something worthwhile. So if you're honest about what you're trying to do, and you're not just trying to make pictures, and you struggle there, and wow, it's only that one corner that's good. This, that's that's what I think about. And the name is Henry. Oh, sorry. Robert no. Henry. And you, the, I have stopped at his his home and there's a, a gallery did, there where in did, where did he live i Co imagine he's and not Cozad, here uh i think it's nebraska and actually i just stopped there a couple of years ago and uh he changed his name because he had a family that was in trouble with the law and he changed changed it to Hen Rye, not Henry. Henry. But I didn't know that for years. I always said Henry, but I just thought that was interesting. Anyway, this little town in Nebraska, I it's at one street long. Really. It's just a, a tiny burg. And that, now they have a museum there of his work. Oh. Huh. It's just oh. tell me about his work. Well, it's it's representational, but it's very simple. And uh, I, I, I think pictures. my book my book had pictures in it. I think. Oh well, this is a pretty old book. Yeah. And uh, I I don't know. I've I've looked at this book forever, and underlined things. And when I don't feel very uh, it says, oh, here's a good one. Any any place you open this book, uh -oh. <laughs> be always looking for the thing you like and not afraid of overstating it. So that's interesting. And like I use color, but I use how does the color make you feel? Not what does it really look like, but yet. I don't know how you how you do that. I I use I use really intense color because you want the emotional impact of the color, but yet it needs to stay somewhat contained in making something realistic. I don't know. I have to think about that. But anyway, you can open this book anywhere and find something that's inspirational. It says. It is not easy to know what you like. Most people fool themselves their entire lives through this. Self-acquaintance is a rare condition. You know, I don't. It doesn't matter where you open this poor old book. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I have yeah, Hawthorne look. on painting, and that's pretty much a. a uh, I've got everything underlined here. But how is it? How is it group? I saw a chapter called Outdoor Model. Uh, and then I don't. I don't remember. And right landscapes. Now. Oh, so it's got sections of like possible subject matter and how to yeah. how to oh, approach it. And the best book is um, the Edgar Payne book. Oh, you know what? That's the pain. That's, that's the, the book. Best. That's the book I have that yes. you told me to get. It's the best. I told you that. Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the one. This one I don't have. I'm going to have to go get yeah. that one. And I've, I've heard so much about the art spirit. This is Hawthorne on painting. And you're going to see it backwards, but, you know, so just so you know what the picture looks like. Oh, Georgia says that she loves that book. Here, let me see. Swipe left to see comments and reactions. I've got my iPad here today so that I don't have to show you my nostrils. So, Jeez. I know. Uh, and Doreen says, uh, the ugly phase, right? I know. I, I totally. I've never heard that. you never heard the ugly <laughs> no. phase of painting? Uh, you just have to believe that something good is going to happen <laughs> to you. you. Just keep moving on. You're just like, I just have to. Because if you, if you got discouraged in that moment, I mean, you never get any further because it's there all the time. Well, I tell you, I just, I learned something this year. I've known it forever. So I, I guess I didn't just learn it, but I took pictures of paintings, my paintings, mm -hmm. that I was going to throw out and did throw out. 
And then I looked at it six months later, and I said, what? What was Why I thinking? Did, what did I do? Because it didn't capture what I was looking for was capturing what I wanted. And I didn't get it. And of course, that's always the intangible thing about right. art. Totally subjective. Yes. But when you look at it later as a painting and not what you didn't get, it's a lot better. <laughs> you know, I do want to say that there's one thing that in my mind you're famous for. What? Wiping your paintings. Oh, God. I cannot tell you how many times we've been out in the field painting together. And she starts a painting. She even gets Wipe it off. She even gets almost to the end. To the end, presumably. And then she decides that she doesn't like it. And out come the paper towels. And poof, it's all gone. That's true. And I'm, 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 I'm always this. and I always look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I'm going for the feel of something. If it just like a couple of days ago, I went painting, and the paint felt thick and wasn't moving. You know, I use that word moving a lot. I didn't realize that. Um, one, I think, I'm not sure if it's in Hawthorne or in Henry. Think about what your subject is doing. Not what it looks like, but what's it doing? Is it, I don't know. I, can't I mean, are you trying it. to cre create like energy, like force? Yeah. 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 Not because that's what I'm interpreting it as. Yeah. I'm not it's sure not if that's like what you trying meant. to copy it so much. Right. But, but right. what is the thing doing? And I always, of course, I don't always do that. Well, but I try. <laughs> Of course. But, uh, and then, oh, here's the book. Sea Biscuit. Has anybody read this book? I saw the movie. Oh, I did read the, I think I did read the book, but I don't well, remember it being with illustrations. Well, it has a lot of, uh, and I mean, I was, I'm not particularly. Here, hold on. I did why, have why a horse. Is it, when, why is this relevant to what we're talking about? To art. Me? Yeah, oh, you. Oh, yeah, you. You're looking at the camera, and I think. Well, I'm, I'm looking at the camera, <laughs> okay. but I'm talking to you. Okay. I'm sorry. The, so why is this relevant? This is, why was this important? This is important because Red Pollard, who was the jockey, and Sea Biscuit were underdogs, and they didn't have a chance. And they not only proved everybody wrong. But they just worked and worked and worked, and they became <laughs> incredibly successful. And every darn thing, every, I mean, he, Red Pollard had broken bones, and, and Seabiscuit had problems, and he was a scrawny horse next to all of these great, big, beautiful thoroughbreds. And... Here he is. Is this somehow, do you see yourself in this? Yes. Isn't and it? Laura Hillenbrand, who wrote this book, wrote it with, what did she have? Uh, for 20 years, she had, uh, I forget, an illness that kept her, kept her down for 20 years. And she still with a lot of pain. What what is it when people have a lot of pain? Fibromyalgia? That no. No. Yeah, maybe Epstein that was Barr? it. Yes. Epstein Barr. And she wrote this book in spite of every obstacle you can imagine. And she wrote a book about <laughs> every obstacle. So it was just uh I just love this book. You just find it inspirational. Yeah, it really is. I, I love that. And then... Oh, we got one more book. One more book. Oh, Soroya. Oh, yeah. Soroya, yeah. Oh, Soroya. Soroya, sorry. You know, I'm just reading. 
Sorry, my Spanish is off today. I don't have any Spanish. Well, I don't congratulations. <laughs> so this this is just so. Uh, oh, here I gotta bring I, this up. Yeah, yeah. The, this painter. Oh. I don't know that much about this painter other than I've seen this work. Ooh. He's Spanish. Yeah, I I saw it in, in, in of all places. I saw it in the Netherlands. You did. Yes. And um, if I can find just, um, I don't know. I mean, these are these are just fine examples of. And here's a Henry too. I saw okay. a Henry exhibit. Here's just an example of of Sor Soroya. Before I say it wrong and get reprimanded. <laughs> <laughs> um, just just really created light and mm -hmm. movement. Oh. I mean, talk about movement. Oh. I mean, I mean, just and you can get the get all of this color, light, and movement whether you do an abstract or you do. This is a Robert Henry, and uh, you can get. It doesn't matter if you do something really tight and representational or something really fluid and abstract. Right. You could get the same no matter what what style you choose. Now, how how did you make that move into abstract work? I mean, what what prompted you? How I mean, there's people in the group that don't understand abstract work mm -hmm. and that, you know, may or may not ever want to do it and have a hard time even looking at it, but sometimes express questions about it. But I, I mean, what how how are you moved to start an abstract work? Are you thinking about a scene and then you just Pretty, sort of blow it up? Uh, I pretty much do abstracts that are landscapes. And if you look at a landscape, I will often see an abstract. Um, let me what see. You this one? Uh, oh. This one with the kids? Here. This, Up here? Okay. I'm going to take it down. Okay. Oh, I can't take yeah. it down. Well, you can hold it. I can hold it. But that's an example of, of abstract kind of background and figurative. Well, this is definitely a mix of figurative so, here. So you have a figurative here in the bottom of the piece. But then when you, I mean, when you look at the, I'm just going to lower this it. Is, this is abstract. Yeah, I was going to say, when you look at the top of the piece. So if you just took this out, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, or this also, just, if you yeah. just put it down. I'm just gonna... This is another one I did uh, about two weeks ago. Oh, that's in a brand new Fern, one? In Ferndell. That looks like an abstract, mm -hmm. but it's really a path through the trees and here's the river, and so you you start as an abstract, right? But you're start you're actually starting from a, a you're looking at something real and tangible. Yes. But you are you're just I don't whatever your process is I'm gonna call it motion it around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean if you take this and you add detail, you add a little leaves here and this and that then you have a realistic painting right right because now because basically it's almost like the depths of your painting without without the detail right and sometimes more detail tells a better story and sometimes but i mean a lot of people would look at this and say it's just an abstract right but it's it's a landscape right so <laughs> I don't know if I'm answering things. No, you are. Right or... So, so then when you're, I mean, how did you finally get to this place? I mean, because if you were working representationally, I mean, and then mm -hmm. everybody's work moves and changes. Sure. I mean, what what did the path of way to moving and changing look like? I mean, was there some sort of aha moment or something? Have that, I changed? Not since I've known you. Well. But I mean, from I mean, when you first started drawing and you were drawing representational all the time and painting representationally mm -hmm. all the time, I mean, to this, this has got to be a change. I from think when... it's just being exposed to things and saying, wow, or 
reading about art and and it's well if you start well the Edgar Payne book you start with an abstract and then that's all you know a landscape and that's as far as you take it or if you want to do something else you know I love it. I never thought about abstracts in this way I love this idea well everything pretty much is an abstract yeah no absolutely but I mean I've never thought about like looking at a landscape and thinking about it oh it, you know like not sometimes yeah. you know especially now that I'm getting older I can understand this better because my eyes don't work as well oh tell me <laughs> you know so <laughs> so everything seems more abstract to me because I don't see detail as much but in the beginning I mean you see I I would always complain about this whenever we tried to paint plein air I I was seeing too much Oh, you always you do. Know, you see too much. It's, it's harder hard. to make it simple than it is to put the details. Everything in there. And I know some people don't believe that. but Well, look at a Rembrandt. You think you're seeing a lot of detail, but you're not. Explain. Well, well I don't have the book here. You, you think it's all detail, but if you really look at it, he didn't put every eyelash in uh, well oh okay you know so uh no i think i understand i mean there, there's suggestions suggestions right i mean the fact if you draw a heavier line over the lid it suggests that there's a shadow and that there's right. eyelashes but there aren't actual eyelashes right that's yes. a rembrandt yes and but people would say oh the rembrandt is realistic and it is but it's done I was thinking, look at this Soroya, how this hat is right. done. You think that's detail, yeah. but it's not. It's not. And so we're talking about the hat detail. I'm going to bring it up real close. But you can see the brush strokes there and that it's not every hair of or every felted wool hair of that hat. And that's the hard. I can't do that. These are these are lucky things that happen for me sometimes. Yeah. You know, sometimes they happen and I'm just like, Woo! Yeah. Oh, no, that's and then it. trying to get it to replicate, oh. it doesn't always happen. And then you think, I'll never be able to do this again. I never and think that. Don't I think always that. do. And then it happens again. <laughs> so you do. Um, so I mean, you are in a super solid place with your work. I mean, you know, well, you know what? I want to talk about something else. You have representation. Oh, yeah. You mean like people who sell my work? Yes. 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 I can, don't do it because I don't like to do it. Can you talk a little bit about how you got representation and what that means? Well, when I first got here, I I showed it was a, a little orange teapot I had uh, painted. And I had sold it to uh, somebody I knew. And she said, well, is there any place you could get this framed for me? So I looked up framers and I went to a uh, monarch frame in, um, I think it's Van Nuys. And somebody, when I brought that teapot in, it was bright orange and uh, real lively. And she said, there was another woman in there getting things framed. And she said, uh, do, do you sell these? And I said, well, not really. Oh, my God. <laughs> and she said, I know somebody who would love to have things like this. So she sent me to somebody who's now in Ojai but did live in Long Beach. And uh, that kind of started it. So it's like. Who you, was this? I mean, you don't have to give me the oh, name of this sure. somebody, but I mean, what did this somebody do? Were they an art oh, dealer? Yes, they're an okay. art dealer, and they take it on take it on road and things around the world. And um, I, I also, I mean, it's just one person talks to another, suggests this and that, and um, right now I'm in a gallery in Bergamot station which is sort of Santa Monica yeah it's sort of the cultural it's kind of a big deal yeah yeah it's a big it's a big deal gallery to be 
it's a big deal area to be in. Yeah. There's a lot of the best artists are, are there. Well, I'm with Kevin Berry there. Oh. And so I'm only, and then there's another, uh, uh, there's a couple people. <laughs> I forget, I'm nervous. I forgot. I forgot. Leonardo. Uh, oh, anyway. And I've, I've gone through a few art dealers. They come and they go. And they're very aggressive, usually. Uh, it's to a you real, or to, their, to ev- their client? It's not to the client. Well, I was, I'm like, what do you mean by aggressive? They're aggressive they in their very, pricing? They're aggressive as salespeople? Yes, they're aggressive as salespeople. And how many homes do you go into where there is original art that somebody's family member didn't do? <laughs> or you know <laughs> the qualifier right there <laughs> right i mean think about it there's not that many so they are fighting each other to get something sold and they the pricing the co- you know and i i recently did uh um some paintings for the icu at uh, what, um, I see you at Inter- UCLA International. No, it's oh. the um, I see you. It's medical. Where? Oh, okay. what, what is that? I see you. Oh, in- uh, intensive care unit. Intensive I'm sorry. Care. I was thinking. I was thinking like union. A union. Oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, okay. The ICU. So I did okay. something for the uh, few things, and uh, sure enough, they didn't like this. They didn't like that. So then you have to repaint and do, it's just, it is just awful. (laughs) And these people who sell your work, boy, they are aggressive. And I'm not an aggressive person. I have trouble dealing with that, but uh, I'd rather deal with them than have to go out and peddle myself. Oh, it's the it's hard part of being an artist. And, you know, they take 50. I had somebody from Chicago call me up once, or write me once, and they wanted to know if I could come down in price. And they had paid, I don't know, could you do something else and come down in the price? And I had sold a piece for $100, and then the consultant sells it for 100 and then the gallery sells it for a hundred, right? Or two hundred, right? Or I was going to say somebody's got to make money somewhere. Some, the artist gets like a fourth right. of what the selling price is, right. and then the framer, and they wanted to know, and I, I said I couldn't do it because I was too embarrassed to say I sold that for a hundred dollars. You know, what are you going to do? You know, it's funny because I just had an experience yesterday. And I, I let everybody know on this, but I went to a little art show and a bunch of unknown people, fine, whatever. And, and I came in with the intent to buy, to support, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. oh, and I was yeah. like, I'm going to find some stuff to support. And so first I went to a table, of course, jewelry calls me, Natalie, buy me. So I look at the jewelry right away. Everybody knows this already. Right away. I look, no pricing is out. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? Mm -hmm. Do you not want, in my head, I'm going, do you not want to sell your work? What the heck? And now I have to talk to you? I don't want to talk to you. Well, and I'll tell you something else. I can tell often, not not in, because I'm not a famous artist and I, you know, that whole thing. Uh, Amateurs often price their work very high I agree and they do that because it's very precious to them Uh, you know that is exactly my thought they don't do a lot I I do a lot I I like this one and I like that one better and or or and it goes out I don't when somebody's got a really high price on something unless it's in a gallery or something you know they're not a professional artist i think that too i'm always thinking number one it took you way too long to make this you Mm -hmm. you know you're not prolific 
that mm-hmm. because as soon as you get prolific and there's a bunch of stuff, you're like, I got to get this stuff out of here. Yeah, I got to move it, yeah. you know, <laughs> get it out of my way. And so when I see that, I'm like, all right, you think that this you, you, and you also think that you can't do this again. That's true. That's the other piece of this puzzle. Well, but I mean, when I, when I see that, I'm always thinking that you think you can't do this again. So this is a one-off and that you're going to make it worth your while. Right. But yeah, but that was my big pet peeve yesterday. I was like, if you want to sell this stuff, number one, put prices. Put prices Number two, don't overprice. Don't overprice because when I see. Don't you want somebody to have this work? You want right. somebody. I mean, we want you. I want artists to be paid. Right. But yes, uh, right. You want other people to be able to enjoy this. And if you yeah. overprice, then nobody's nobody's going to be able to do that. No. And I have argued with galleries, and galleries aren't very important anymore. And I no. don't know what where that all is right now, uh, because I don't really work with too many galleries. But uh, yeah, that. Don't price too high. It, put your prices on it. And you can, you know, I tell you, some of the best work I've ever seen has been very low price. When Kim does a job, the best jobs he do, does, he gets $25 for. You know, the oh worse God. the job, the more money he gets. <laughs> so, no, it is absolutely true. It's absolutely, oh, we'll talk about that. Yeah, I don't even <laughs> okay. want to know about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you guys, I'm going to look and see if there's any questions here, because I see that there's some stuff happening. All right. Hi. Hello, Clifton. Hello, Anthony. Hello, Sylvia. Hello, Georgia and Doreen. Hello, Kathy. Oh, look at you. You're here today. I love that. Um, Georgia saying, I'm loving your conversation about pricing. Right? Oh. Yeah. Um, Anthony says, as, a, as an art dealer, this is what I'm ready for. Is there a directory of art dealers? I love your work. Talking mm. about you. Totally enamored by abstract art. Anthony's really, I interviewed him last week. and oh. he's, He does work in tape. I saw that. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, but he's ready to deal with art dealers. Do you mm. have an idea of how to get that? Well, I would go around to Bergamot and just look at what, People are selling, and uh, I don't really know how to approach because I've always been recommended, and I think being recommended is really a great way to do it. Gosh, that means getting out in front and networking and so forth. I heard once that one of your your the best things you can do for selling work is your your uh, community the people right. you know and they and I agree. just and I think there's something to that I've approached I've approached a gallery in Palm Springs when I was here early 30 years ago and they did take my work uh, but it was so hard and uh, gosh I said I don't want to do this but then I've had to do it, and uh, it is difficult. But you don't have to be the greatest artist in the world to get representation. You you have to be prolific. You do. I would I would say that that's it. You and have to have a bunch of work and ready to have them come in and take three pieces when you have fifty available. Right. I think you do have to be prolific. Yes, that's true. Yeah. And, uh, but there's not, there's not like a group or an organization the art dealers organization of America or something. Do you know anything like that? I, I mean, I'm just making this stuff up. Maybe there is. I would look at just under art consultants in, in Los Angeles. There's a lot of them. He's, Those the, would be the places. Anthony to go. happens to be in Hemet, but you might want to check art consultants in Palm Springs, Anthony, that might be an yeah. avenue for you. But the, the consultant is the way for me to go um, and they'll say well I don't know I can't use this but somebody else might you know well maybe they would use it or and then you know it's it's just this road yeah there's no clear path yeah and I, I say and when you're approaching gallery owners too you're looking for places that have work that's 
compatible to yours. Yes. You know, um, you don't want to bring in very classical stuff to somebody who's doing abstract or, or you right. know, more modernistic work. It's not going to fit with their aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep that in mind as well. And another thing is, boy, you have to be able to take no. And it's hard, but you there's a lot of no's. I don't like it. Uh, one thing I did this. <laughs> I don't like it. Get it away. I'll say. I know. I know. I, I tell you, it's an aggressive business. Um, two years ago, I had a commission to do something, a, a painting of a golf course with people in it. I said, oh, gosh, I don't do that. So, but, okay. And they wanted a huge painting. So I did that. And no, they didn't like like this, and they didn't like that, and they didn't want the people in the painting to be blondes. They had to be dark. No, I have a question. And While you were doing this, every were you making revisions every time they'd come back? Every so, so you did a whole painting, and then they come back, and they're like, I don't like this, and then you do a revision, and then I, they come back. Oh my I gosh. was nuts, and I said, I'm never going to paint anything again. Ever. <laughs> well, that's after that, I went back to Wisconsin, and there was a, a kid there working, and he was uh, uh, an artist who designed toys. And he designed toys for, I don't know, what, what, Hasbro? Or, I was just going to say Hasbro, Mattel, uh, whatever. Yeah. And uh, he said, I said, oh, gosh look at those drawings you've got. Those are beautiful. And, and uh, he said, you, you use, do you use, uh, uh, I, what is it? I, I create or, oh, I don't know. Cause he, he was doing digital work. Right. And I said, no, I said, no, I don't do that at all. And he said, this, anyway, he introduced me to it. He got me a used uh, Apple iPad and, uh, he said, here's what you do. Now, before I do the huge painting that they want to revise and they don't like the color, I do it on the iPad. And you paint it and then you send it to the dealer and they'll say this, oh, that's good, or that. I just did that oh, recently. Oh, much easier. So like for the, the ICU at UCLA, mm -hmm. I, I did it, and they did not like it, and so I had to do it over, and... Uh, but now you're only doing work on an iPad, where right. it's a lot smaller, a lot probably a lot faster, obviously. Oh, yeah, and it, and they can see that it's just a design, you right. know, it's not... It's not a finished work. Right, and you click the button, there it goes. Congratulations <gasps> for making that leap, because I know that this was really probably really hard for you. It is still hard because I don't really get all of it. But now I take the iPad with me everywhere I go. If I'm in an airport, if I'm at the, the DMV, uh, if I'm at a job with Kim and it's dark and I turn the lights down on the iPad mm -hmm. and then I can draw there, I can draw anywhere. And when I'm back in the summertime, I host us in, in my family's restaurant and and bar. And uh, I can't have my hands full of charcoal right. or ink. Right. It doesn't look good. It does not <laughs> look good. But if you're doing something on an iPad, they'll say, oh, what are you doing there? And, or, and then you can set it down and take the people to the table Instant and bring them some started. water yeah, and especially if people are waiting for tables. Yeah, and they say, and they say, oh, what are you doing? And you know, right? I actually sell a lot of work out of the resort. I bet. <laughs> you know, it's like I bet because now yeah. you're a real person. Yeah, and and they're like, that's yours. You did that. Yeah, and now they're having an experience at the resort. You right. know, everything is coming together. They right. need a memento, and yeah. this is more meaningful than just having some it plastic is. trinket. From it China. sure is. <laughs> But, you know, so the iPad, I'm pushing myself into technology, and yet I can't even get those posts done for 
Facebook and Instagram. Now, I'm working on it. I was going to say, what did you tell me? You're going to do I'm it. I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There's one other question I want to ask, oh. ask you about, because I know that you have like sensitivities to chemicals. Oh. And, yeah, and, skin just, and yeah, stress. all this stuff with the paint, but you work in oils. I do. Now I know that there's specific brands that you really like working mm -hmm. with for specific oh. reasons. Can you talk about that a little bit? What, what, yeah, are, you, where what are you looking my, for? My paint. I don't know. Where is your paint? Uh oh, I use caulking tubes. Caulking tubes of paint? Yeah. This here. Well, what? Does it come I like use, does this? It come is, like this? this is how it comes, the t paint I use. It's a very small company in uh, New York. And uh, RGH. RGH. The color is better than a gambling or anything. So they fill these tubes custom for you. I mean, so yes. there's like that's the red color. This is the tube, a caulking tube, and you use a caulking gun to get the paint yes. out? Oh, my God. This is genius. And uh, and then I put a little plastic. Put a little tape on it so it yeah. stays. Yeah. yeah. And so I, because I do use a lot of paint. Of course you do. But um, RGH, that is the best paint. Now, I noticed here, because I know that you, for a while you, you were using Martha, Martha Graham? I am yes. Graham. Yes. And they use walnut, walnut oil. oil. And this one uses linseed. <clears throat> this isn't some bothering them, you? Some some of them they use walnut oil and some. And some of them they don't. But I wear, you know, a full mask anytime I go and paint uh, a respirator. And then I put You gl wear gloves. Wear gloves and I wear the sleeves. And you could get those those obstacles obstetrician obstetric gloves for cows oh, i was just gonna i was yeah. just thinking about that the kind where they reach yeah. in to like yeah. inseminate the animals right yeah so you, need the, so you get got, the long I've got those too <laughs> you really are country girl <laughs> i am <laughs> so i but this this really saves you paint there i would say they're fairly they're not expensive like they're not as expensive as M Graham, but this is so far this and classic oils are the best paints. Now, can you tell me like how much did this? I mean, I know colors um, vary wildly, oh, gosh. but I mean, uh, how how much is a basic giant tube of paint like that? Oh, seventy, eighty dollars. Really? That's not bad. I I I thought they were fairly reasonable. Yeah. I mean, yeah, R G H. Out of Albany, New York, they have the best customer service. It's just a little bitty company. Well, I don't know bitty, but it's a small company. The owner, you know, calls you if he's mm -hmm. got a question. And uh, oh, I tell you, it's, it's saved me. <laughs> um, that, that's, that's awesome. Um, do you just use, what do you use to thin it with? Walnut oil. Um, and also a gambling solvent free. The Gamsol? No, it's a solvent free uh, medium. Oh, because it, it's um, is it Gal Kid? No. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna keep guessing. Well, I is it the one that makes it, it? Oh, is it the tube one that you like? I I use that, but I sometimes, but I also I like the kind in the bottle better. It's a little. It does. It's just called solvent free medium. I yeah. Guess. And it makes it a little bit glossy, puts a little, a little bit of gloss. Bit, yeah. 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 Gloss oh, it's good. Paint. Yeah. It, it is good. It's easier to breathe. <laughs> but if I have to, I will use uh, something that dries fast. And uh, I know Galkid usually dries fast. But. Yeah. But I don't like to do it. But I always wear a respirator. Yeah. And I have to. Now you work pretty chunky in in your oils. I mean, there's always texture. How long mm -hmm. do you find that it usually takes your paintings to dry? Mm, that could just be so different. Depends on the color, of course. I was just gonna say some colors dry faster than others. Yeah, you know, white never dries. 
Um, I, I don't know. A couple months. Mm, no, I'd say a week or oh, so. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, the, the dry, dry enough to touch it, but not yeah. necessarily perfectly, completely right. stable. Right. Gotcha. And I try not to go over the uh, dried painting, like, you know. Well, that makes sense because of the mm -hmm. way you work. If you're looking right. for flow and you don't want to touch things too many times. I will touch things up. Um, like if I do a painting that uh, it's just, oh, it's almost there. It's almost there. And I'll stop it if I'm out, out plein air painting. And then bring it in and uh, just sit, let it sit for a day or so. And then I might put a few things on it but that's that takes actually more time than the painting does you know putting those touches on yeah it. but I'll see all kinds of things and then don't touch it don't touch it you know but I do sometimes I throw <laughs> it out <laughs> <laughs> all right let me see uh so I mean I'm okay my gosh do I use my hands all the time we all do uh, I guess we may be having another pricing discussion now, Lee Fertina. Oh. That's from Clifton, yes. Getting published, hopefully, may help me, yes. Clifton Clifton is on the verge of making some breakthroughs here. He's getting Ooh. some work in some galleries, and he's getting oh, stuff great. shown, and he's super prolific. So it's very cool. Uh, Doreen Morgan's asking if you're working in Procreate on Procreate. your iPad. It is Procreate, It is Doreen. Procreate. Okay. And Anthony Villarreal says painting on the iPad is for her to create the idea and then she paints. Is that yes, correct? That's yes, that's right. I never use the 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 sketch for a, for know. anything finished. It's simply no. an idea. It's to an idea up. to get a <coughs> painting done, uh, or a client to see what I'm doing, or you know. But I just find the the iPad so much fun to just sketch. Yeah. You know, and it's so clean. <laughs> do you use your finger or do you have a little yeah. pointer thing? No, I have a pencil. pencil. Oh, you have it. an Apple pencil? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, Procreate is just, it's real eye-opening, but I don't really know much about it yet. But All right. Well, I think I don't know what time. I have no idea what time it is. I These don't things either. do not help me at all. Here, let's see if I can figure this out. I think oh, we've covered a lot. Yeah, we've been <laughs> at it for an hour. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I just want you all to know, she's like, let's keep it shorter, shall we? <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I can't shut up. <laughs> all right. Um, do you want to give any parting words um, for our lovely people that are watching? Oh, just don't give up. Everything you do is worth something. It's It's that you saw something. You felt something. Uh, you know, one, one thing a friend and I go out and paint, and we paint barefoot because you feel the earth. I think that's such a good thing for you, for everybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and just go out and feel and see or, or the still life or it's an abstract. And don't sell yourself short. Please don't. It's so important that you do it. And uh, it doesn't matter if it doesn't turn out just so it's that you saw something you felt something you you did something that's the important thing more than the product at the end product that's not the important right. part right. so do it <laughs> all right you guys have a beautiful afternoon and we'll talk to you later see you next week